everybody. Welcome back for our final week of third grade. This week I'm going to be finishing the one and only Ivan. This book we have been reading for the past two weeks. It's by Katherine Applegate. And when we finish reading, you can take an AR test. I have put the electronic copy on Connect for the past few weeks, and I will for this week as well, so that you can log on and read this if you would like on the electronic version, the electronic copy of the book. Um, so it is a PDF, so it's not something that you can download, but you can look online and you can read the book there. Last week, we, we've been um, doing a third every week for the past three weeks. So last week, we got up to about page 206, and this week, we will start at page 207 and read through the end of the book. I had a lot of you guys join Zoom this week and tell me how much you love this book, that maybe this book reminded you of some other books. I had some people say it reminded them of Charlotte's Web um, because of the animals and the animals talking. So I really, really like this book and I'm excited for this week's reading. Remember that this week there are no assignments. There are no optional assignments. There's no vocabulary. Um, this is our final week of school, so it's kind of like a spirit week type of week. Tuesday is going to be craft and activity day. We're going to be doing a craft together on Zoom. Um, Wednesday is going to be game day. We'll do a game together on Zoom. Thursday will be fitness day. Miss Dubosk will be doing a fitness activity with you guys, and Friday is going to be choice day. I'm excited to see you guys on Zoom, and I hope you enjoy this week's reading. The one and only Ivan. Chest Beating Often, when visitors come to see me, they beat their hands against their puny chest, pretending to be me. They pound away, soundless as the wet wings of a new butterfly. The chest beating of a mad gorilla is not something you ever want to hear. Not even if you're wearing earplugs. Not even if you're three miles away wearing earplugs. A real chest beating sends the whole jungle running, as if the sky has broken open, as if men with guns are near. Angry. Thump. The sound, my sound, echoes through the mall. George and Julia spin around. Julia drops her backpack. George drops his keys. The pile of pictures goes flying. Thump, thump, thump. I bounce off the walls. I screech and bellow. I beat and beat and beat my chest. Bob hides under knot tag, his paws over his ears. I'm angry at last. I have someone to protect. Who is he protecting? Puzzle pieces. After a long while, I go quiet. I sit. It's hard work being angry. Julia looks at me with wide, disbelieving eyes. I'm panting. I'm a little out of shape. What the heck was that? George demands. Something's really wrong, Julia says. I've never seen Ivan act this way. He seems to be calming down now, thank goodness, George says. Julia shakes her head. He's still upset, Dad. Look at his eyes. My pictures are scattered all over the floor like huge autumn leaves. What a mess, George says, sighing. Wish I hadn't bothered sweeping tonight. Do you think Ivan's okay? Julia asks. Probably just a temper tantrum, George says. He reaches under a chair to retrieve a brown and red picture. Can't say I blame the guy, stuck in that tiny cage all these years. Julia starts to answer, but then she freezes. She cocks her head. She stares at her feet where my pictures lie in disarray. Dad, she whispers, come see this. I'm sure he's another Rembrandt, George says. Let's pick these up and get go going, Jules. I'm exhausted. Dad, she says again, seriously, look at this. George follows her gaze. I see blobs, many, many blobs, along with the occasional swirl. Please, can we go home now? That's an H, Dad. Julia kneels down, straightening one picture, then another. 
That's an H. And here, she grabs more pictures. Put this one here. And I don't know, maybe that one. You have an E. George rubs his eyes. I hold my breath. Julia is running now. She picks up one picture, sets down another. It's like a puzzle, Dad. This is something. It's a word, maybe words, and a picture of something, a giant picture. Jules, George says, this is crazy. But he's looking at the floor, too, wandering from picture to picture and scratching his head. H, Julia says. E, O, Ho? Julia chews her lower lip. H-E-O. Well, that looks a lot like an I. H-E-O-I? George writes in the ear with his finger. I-E-O-H? Not the letter, an actual I. And that's a foot. Or maybe a tree. And a trunk, Dad. I think that's a trunk. Julia runs to my window. Ivan, she whispers. What did you make? I stare back. I cross my arms. This is taking much longer than I thought it would. Humans. Sometimes they make chimps look smart. Finally. Julia and George take the pictures to the ring where there's room to see them all. An hour passes as they try to assemble my puzzle. Ruby's awake now, and she and Bob and I watch. Ivan, Ruby says, is that a picture of me? Yes, I say proudly. Where am I supposed to be? That's a zoo, Ruby. See the walls and the grass and the people looking at you? Ruby squints. Who are all those other elephants? You haven't met them, I say. Yet. It's a very nice zoo, Ruby says with an approving nod. Bob nudges me with his cold nose. It is indeed. In the ring, Julia pumps her fist in the air. Yes, she cries. I told you, Dad. There it is. H-O-M-E. Home. George gazes at the letters. He spins around to look at me. Maybe it's just a coincidence, Jules. You know, a once in a trillion kind of thing, like that old saying about the chimp and the typewriter. Give him long enough and he'll write a novel. I make a grumbling noise. As if a chimp could write a letter, let alone a book. Then how do you explain the rest of it, Julia demands. The picture of Ruby in the zoo? How do you know it's a zoo, George asks. See the circles on the gate? There's a red giraffe in it. George squints and tilts his head. Are you sure that's a giraffe? I was thinking more along the lines of a deformed cat. It's the logo for the zoo, Dad. It's on all their signs. Explain that. George gives her a helpless smile. I can't. I can't begin to. I'm just saying there has to be a logical explanation. Look how big this is. Julia puts the last piece of Ruby's right ear into place. It's huge. It is definitely large, George agrees. Julia watches me. She chews on her thumbnail. I see the question in her eyes. She turns back to the paintings and stares at them, looking, truly looking. A slow smile dawns on Julia's face. Dad, she says, I have an idea, a big idea. Julia races around the edge of my painting, her arms spread wide, billboard big. I'm not following you. I think this is meant to be on a billboard. That's what Ivan wants. George crosses his arms over his chest. What Ivan wants, he repeats slowly. And you know this because you two have been chatting? Because I'm an artist, and he's an artist. Uh-huh, says George. Julia clasps her hands together. Come on, Dad, I'm begging you. George shakes his head. No, I'm not doing that. No billboard, no way. I'll get the ladder, Julia says. You get the glue. I know it's dark out, but the billboard's lit. Mac will fire me, Jules. Julia considers. But think of the publicity, Dad. Everybody would know about Ruby. You want me to put up a sign that shows Ruby in a zoo with the word home on it in giant letters? George gestures towards my pictures. A sign, incidentally, 
that just happens to have been made by a gorilla? Exactly. And you want me to do it without Mac's permission, George asks. Exactly. No, George says. No way. Julia goes to the edge of the ring, careful not to step on any of my paintings. She picks up Mac's claw stick. She walks back and hands it to her father. George runs a finger along the blade. She's just a baby dad. Don't you want to help her? But how would it help, Jules? Even if lots of people see Ivan's sign, it doesn't mean anything's going to change. I'm not exactly sure yet, Julia shakes her head. Maybe people will see the sign and they'll know this isn't where Ruby belongs. Maybe they'll want to help too. George sighs. He looks at Ruby. She waves her trunk. It's a matter of principle, Dad. P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. L-E, George corrects. Dad, Julia says softly. What if Ruby ends up like Stella? George looks at me, at Ruby, at Julia. He drops the claw stick. The latter, he says quietly, is in the storage locker. The next morning, I watch Mac's car slam to a halt in the parking lot. He leaps out. He stares at the billboard. His jaw is open. He doesn't move for a long time. Mad human. A mad gorilla is loud, but a mad human can be loud too, especially when he is throwing chairs and turning over tables and breaking the cotton candy machine. Phone call. Mac is kicking a trash can across the food court when the phone rings. He answers it, red-faced and sweating. What the? He demands. He glares at me. I don't know what you're... He starts to say, but then he stops to listen. Who? Julia who? He asks. Oh, sure. George's kid. She's the one who called you? More talking. With the phone to his ear, Mac comes closer to my cage, eyeing me suspiciously. Yeah, yeah, he says. He paints, sure. We've been selling his art for quite a while now. There's another long pause. Yeah, absolutely. It was my idea. Mac nods. A smile starts at the corners of his mouth. Photos? No problem. You want to see him in action? Come on down, have a look. We're open 365 days a year. Can't miss us. We're right off I-95. Mac picks up the overturned trash can. Yeah, I think he'll be adding more pictures. It's a, you know, what do you call it? A work in progress. When the call is done, Mac shakes his head. Impossible. An hour later, a man with a camera comes to take my picture. He is from the local paper, the one Julia called. How about you take one of me with the elephant? Mac suggests. He drapes his arm around Ruby's back, grinning as the camera clicks. Perfect, the man, the man says. Perfect, Mac agrees. Was this Ivan's plan? A star again. A photo of my billboard is in the newspaper. Mac tapes the story onto my window. Each day, more curious people arrive. They park in front of the billboard. They point and shake their heads. They take photos. Then they come into the mall and buy my paintings. While visitors watch, I dip my hands in fresh buckets of paint. I make pictures for the gift shop and pictures to add to the billboard. Trees with birds. A newborn elephant with glittering black eyes. A squirrel. A blackbird. A worm. A bluebird. A worm. I even paint Bob so he can be on the billboard, too. I can tell he likes the picture, although he says I didn't quite capture his distinguished nose. Every afternoon, Mac and George add my new pic pictures to the billboard. People slow their cars while they work. Drivers honk and wave. My gift shop pictures now cost $65 with frame. The Ape Artist I have new names. People call me the ape artist, the primate Picasso. I have visitors from morning till night, and so does Ruby. But nothing's changed for her. Every day at 2, 4, and 7, Ruby plods through the sawdust with Snickers on her back. 
Every night she has bad dreams. Bob, I say, after I've soothed Ruby to sleep with a story. My idea isn't working. Bob opens one eye. Be patient. I'm tired of being patient, I say. Interview. This evening, a man and woman come to interview Mac and also George and Julia. The man has a large, heavy camera perched on his shoulder. He films me as I make my pictures. He films Ruby in her cage with her foot roped to the bolt in the floor. Mind if I take a look around, he asks. Mac waves a hand. Be my guest. While Mac and the woman talk, the cameraman walks through the mall. He pans his camera right and left, up and down. When his eyes fall on the claw stick, he stops. He trains his camera on the gleaming blade. Then he moves on. The early news. Mac turns on the TV. We are on the early news at five o'clock. Bob says, don't let it go to my head. There we all are, Mac, Ruby, me, George and Julia, the billboard, the mall, the ring, and the claw stick. Signs on sticks. In the morning, several people gather in the parking lot. They are carrying signs on sticks. The signs have words and pictures on them. One has a drawing of a gorilla cradling a baby elephant. I wish I could read. Protesters. More people with signs come today. They want Ruby to be free. Some of them even want Mac to shut down the mall. In the evening, George and Mac talk about them. Mac says they're protesting the wrong guy. He says they're going to ruin everything. He says, thanks for nothing, George. Mac stomps off. George, holding his mop, watches him leave. He rubs his eyes. He looks worried. Dad, Julia says, looking up from her homework. You know what my favorite sign was? Hmm, George asks. Which one? The one that said, elephants are people too. George gives her a tired smile. He goes back to work. His mop moves across the empty food court like a giant brush, painting a picture that no one will ever see. Check marks. A tall man with a clipboard and pencil come to visit us. He says, a tall man with a clipboard and pencil comes to visit us. He says he is here to inspect the property. He doesn't say much more, but he makes many check marks on his paper. He looks at my floor. Check. He examines Ruby's hay. Check. He eyes our water bowls. Check. Mac watches him, scowling. Bob is outside, hiding near the dumpster. He does not want to be a check mark. Free Ruby. Every day there are more protesters and cameras with bright lights. Sometimes the people carrying signs shout, Free Ruby! Free Ruby! Ivan, Ruby asks, Why are those people yelling my name? Are they mad at me? They're mad, I say, but not at you. A week later, the inspecting man comes back with a friend, a woman with smart, dark eyes like my mother's. She has a white coat on, and she smells like lobelia blossoms. Her hair is thick and brown, the color of a rotten branch teeming with luscious ants. She watches me for a long time, and she watches Ruby. She talks to the man. They both talk to Mac. The man gives Mac a sheet of paper. Mac covers his face. He goes to his office and slams the door. New box. Something strange is happening. The white-coated woman is back with other humans. They place a large box in the center of the ring. It's ruby-sized. And suddenly I know why the woman is here. She's here to take Ruby away. Hmm, what's this symbol? Familiar? Training. The woman leads Ruby to the box. She places an apple inside. Good girl, Ruby, she says kindly. Don't be afraid. Ruby inspects the box with her trunk. <clears throat> the woman makes a clicking sound with a little piece of metal she is holding in her hand. She gives Ruby a piece of carrot. Each time Ruby touches the box, she gets a click and a treat. Why is she making that clicking noise? I ask Bob. They do that to dogs all the time, Bob says. I can tell he doesn't approve. It's called clicker training. 
They want Ruby to associate the noise with a treat. When she does something they want, they make that noise. Great job, Ruby, the woman says. You're a, a quick study. After many clicks and carrots, she takes Ruby back to her cage. Why is that lady giving me carrots when I touch the box? Ruby asks me. I think she wants you to go inside, I explain. But there's nothing inside, Ruby says, except an apple. Inside that box, I say, is the way out. Ruby tilts her head. I don't get it. See the picture of the red giraffe on the box? I think the lady is from the zoo, Ruby. I think she's getting ready to take you there. I wait for Ruby to trumpet with joy, but instead, she just stares at the box in silence. I'm not sure you understand. That box might be taking you to a place where there are other elephants, I say. A place with more room and humans who care about you. But even as I say these words, I remember with a shudder the last box I was in. I don't want a zoo, Ruby says. I want you and Bob and Julia. This is my home. No, Ruby, I say. This is your prison. Poking and prodding. The lady comes again. She brings an animal doctor with an awful smell and a dangerous looking bag. He spends an hour with Ruby, poking and prodding. He looks at her eyes, her feet, her trunk. When he's done with Ruby, he enters my cage. I wish I could hide under knot tag like Bob. Instead, I do a nice, loud chest beat, and after a moment, the doctor retreats. We're going to need to put this one under, he says. I'm not quite sure what he means, but I strut around my cage, feeling victorious anyway. No painting. No one asks me to paint today. No one asks Ruby to perform. There are no shows, no visitors unless you count the protesters. Max stays in his office all day. More boxes. I wake up from a long morning nap. Bob is on my belly, but he isn't asleep. He's watching the ring where four men are placing a large metal box. It's me-sized. What's that? I ask, still blurry from sleep. Bob nuzzles my chin. I believe that box is for you, my friend. I'm not sure what he means. Me? They brought in a bunch of boxes while you were sleeping. Looks to me like they're taking the whole lot of you, he says casually, licking a paw. Even Thelma. Taking, I repeat. Taking us where? Well, some to the zoo, probably. Others to an animal shelter where humans will try to find them homes. Bob shakes himself. So I guess all good things must come to an end, huh? His voice is bright, but his eyes are far away and sad. I'm going to miss your stomach, big guy. Bob shuts his eyes. He makes an odd noise in his throat. But what about you? I ask. I can't tell if Bob's just pretending to sleep, but he doesn't answer. I gaze at the huge shadowy box and suddenly I understand how Ruby feels. I don't want to go into that box. The last time I was in a box, my sister died. Goodbye. When George and Julia come that night, George doesn't get his mop or his broom. He gathers up his tools and belongings while Julia runs to my cage. This is my last night, Ivan, she says, and she presses her palm to my glass. Mac fired my dad. Tears slip down her cheeks. But the zoo lady said maybe they'll have an opening there in a while, cleaning cages and stuff. I walk to the glass that separates us. I put my hand to where Julia's is, palm to palm, finger to finger. My hand is bigger, but they're not so different. I'm going to miss you, Julia says, and Ruby and Bob. But this is a good thing. Really, it is. You deserve a different life. I stare into her dark eyes and wish I had words for her. Sniffling, she goes to Ruby's cage. Have a good life, Ruby, she says. Ruby makes a little rumbling sound. She puts her trunk between the bars and touches Julia's shoulder. Where is Bob anyway, Julia asks. She looks around, under tables, in my cage, by the trash can. Dad, she calls. Have you seen Bob? Bob? No, George says. Julia's brown wrinkles, brow wrinkles. What's going to happen to him, Dad? What if Max shuts down the whole mall? He says he's going to try to keep it open without the animals, George says. He stuffs his hands into his pockets. 
I'm worried about Bob, too, but he's a survivor. You know what, Dad? Julia gets a gleam in her eye. Bob could live with us. Mom loves dogs, and he could keep her company, and Jules, I'm not even sure I have a job yet. I may not even be able to feed you, let alone some mutt. My dog walking money. Sorry, Jules. Julia nods. I understand. She starts to leave, then runs back to my cage. I almost forgot. This is for you, Ivan. She slips a piece of paper into my cage. It's a drawing of Ruby and me. We're eating yogurt raisins. Ruby is playing with another baby elephant, and I'm holding hands with a lovely gorilla. She has red lips and a flower in her hair. I look, as I always do in Julia's pictures, like an elegant fellow, but something is different about this drawing. In this picture, I am smiling. Click. The door to my cage is propped open. I can't stop staring at it. My door, open. The giant box has been moved, and it's open too. The humans have pushed it up against my doorway. If I walk through my door, I enter their box. The zoo lady, whose name is Maya, is here again. Click, yogurt raisin. Click, tiny marshmallow. Click, ripe papaya. Click, apple slice. Hour after hour, click after click. I look over at Ruby. She waits to see what I will do. I touch the box. I sniff the dark interior where a ripe mango awaits. Click, click, click. I have to do it. Ruby is watching me from between the bars of her cage, and this box is the way out. I step inside. An idea. After I leave the box and step back into my cage, I get an idea, a good one. I tell Bob he can sneak into my box with me and live at the zoo. Have you forgotten? I'm a wild beast, Ivan, he says, sniffing the floor for crumbs. I am untamed, undaunted. Bob samples a piece of celery and spits it out. Besides, they notice. Humans are dumb, but they're not that dumb. Respect. Ivan, Ruby says, do you think the other elephants will like me? I think they'll love you, Ruby. You'll be part of their family. Do you think the other gorillas will like you? Ruby asks. I'm a silverback, Ruby. A leader. I pull back my shoulders and hold my head high. They don't have to like me. They have to respect me. Even as I tell her this, I wonder if I can ever command their respect. I haven't had much practice being a real gorilla, much less a silverback. Do you think the other elephants will know any jokes? If they don't, I tell her, you can teach them. Ruby flaps her ears. She flicks her tail. You know what, Ivan? What, I ask. I think I'm going to go in the box tomorrow. I gaze at her fondly. I think that's a good idea. And I think Stella would have agreed. Do you think the other elephants will know how to play tag? I love tag. <laughs> Me too, I say and I think of my nimble sister racing through the bush, always just out of my reach. Photo. Late at night, Mac opens my cage. The full moon falls on his sagging shoulders. He seems smaller somehow. Bob, instantly alert, leaps off my stomach and dives under knot tag. Don't bother hiding, dog, Mac says. I know you're sleeping here. Mac settles onto my tire swing. Might as well stay one more night. Your buddy's leaving tomorrow. Tomorrow? My stomach drops. I'm not ready. I need more time. I haven't said my goodbyes. I haven't thought this through. Mac pulls a small photo out of his shirt pocket. It's me when I was young. Mac and I are in the front seat of his convertible. I'm wearing a baseball cap and eating an ice cream cone. I was a handsome lad, but I have to admit I look ridiculous. Nothing like a real gorilla. We had some laughs, didn't we, guy? Max says. Remember when we went on that roller coaster? Or that time I tried to teach you to play basketball? Max shakes his head, chuckling. You had a lousy jump shot. He stands, sighs, looks around. He puts the photo back in his pocket. I'm going to miss you, Ivan, he says. And then he leaves. He doesn't look back. Leaving. 
Early in the morning, Maya arrives with many other humans. Some have white coats, some have rustling papers. They are hushed, busy, determined. Ruby enters her box first. I'm scared, Ivan, she calls from inside the box. I don't want to leave you. A part of me doesn't want her to leave either, but I know I can't tell her that. Think of all the amazing stories you can share with your new family, I say. Ruby falls silent. I'll tell them your elephant joke, she says after a long pause. The one about the refrigerator? I bet they'd like that. And be sure to tell them about Bob and Julia and me, I clear my throat. <clears throat> and Stella. I'll remember everyone, Ruby says, especially you. Before I can say any more, they roll her cage out to a waiting truck. It's my turn. Bob is hiding in a corner behind my pool. The humans don't even notice him. While they're busy making sure my box is ready, Bob sneaks over. He licks my chin just in case there are any leftovers. You, I whisper, are the one and only Bob. I reach for knot tag. She is a limp rag without her stuffing. Dribbles of paint cover her fur. I hold her out to Bob. He, he tilts his head, confused. To help you sleep, I say. Bob takes her in his teeth and slips away. Good boy. Good, Ivan. Good boy, Maya says when I lumber into my box. I hear the clicker and I'm rewarded with a tiny marshmallow. When I'm settled, Maya gives me a sweet drink that tastes of mango and something bitter. My eyelids grow heavy. I want to see what happens next, but I am sleepy, so sleepy. I dream I'm with Tag and we're swinging from vines while Stella watches. The sun slices through the thick ceiling of trees and the breeze tastes like fruit. Moving. My eyes flutter open. The box is moving. I am in the grumbling belly of some great beast. I fall back asleep. Awakening. I awake to glass and steel. It's a new cage, not unlike my old cage, except that it's much cleaner. Mai is here and other humans I recognize. Hey there, Ivan, Maya says. He's coming too, guys. I have three walls of glass. The fourth wall is a curtain of wooden slats strung together. This doesn't look like the zoos on TV. Where are the other animals? Where are the gorillas? Is this where Ruby ended up? In a cage just like her old cage, still alone? Is she cold? Hungry? Sad? Is there anyone to tell her stories when she can't get to sleep? Missing. I miss my old, cozy cage. I miss my art. And most of all, I miss Bob. My belly's cold without him. Food. The food is fine here. No soda, though, or cotton candy. Not famous. I have no visitors here. No sticky-fingered children or weary parents. Only Maya and her humans come with their soothing voices and soft hands. I wonder if I have stopped being famous. Something in the air. Endless days pass, and then I notice something. A change. I don't know what it is, but I taste it in the air like far-off rain clouds gathering. A new TV. Maya brings me a TV. It is bigger than my old one. She turns it on. I think you're going to like this show, she says, smiling. I'm hoping for a romance, or maybe a western, but it's a nature show, one without human voices or ads. It's a show about gorillas being gorillas. I watch them eat and groom and play fight. I even watch them sleep. I wonder why Mac never put on this channel. The family. Each day I watch the gorillas on the TV screen. It's a small family and an odd one, just three females and a juvenile male without a silver pipe to protect them. They groom each other and eat and sleep, then groom each other some more. They are a contented group, placid and good-natured, although, like any family, they bicker from time to time. Excited. This morning, for some reason, there is no gorilla show on TV. Maya and the other humans are excited. They chirp like birds at dawn. Today's the day, they say. I've watched many humans watch me, but never have they looked so happy. Maya goes to the wall of wooden slats. 
She grins goofily. She pulls a string. What I see. Gorillas. Three females and a juvenile male. It's the family I've been watching, but they're not on a TV screen. They're on the other side of the glass, watching me, watching them. I see me. Lots of me. Still there. I cover my eyes. I look again. They are still there. Watching. Every day I watch them through my window the way my visitors used to watch me. See how they chase, groom, see how they play, sleep, see how they live. They're graceful the way Stella was, moving just enough, only as much as they need. They stare at me, heads tilted, pointing and hooting, and I wonder, are they as fascinated by me as I am by them? She. Her hoots make my ears hurt. I admire her intact canines from afar. Her name is Kenyani. She is faster than I am, spry and probably smarter, although I am twice her size, and that too is important. She is terrifying and beautiful, like a painting that moves. Door. Today the humans lead me to a door. On the other side, Kimyani and the others wait for me. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready to be a silverback. I'm Ivan, just Ivan, only Ivan. I decide it's not a good day to socialize. I'll try again tomorrow. Wondering. All night I lie awake, wondering about Ruby. Has she already walked through a door like the one I'm facing? Was she as scared as I am? Scared the, the way she must have been the day she fell in the hole? I think of Ruby's endless curiosity and of the questions she loved to ask. Have you ever danced with a tiger, Ivan? Will your fur turn blue? Why doesn't that little boy have a tail? If Ruby were here with me, she'd be asking, What's on the other side of the door, Ivan? Ruby would want to know, and she would have been through that door by now. Ready. Want to try again, Ivan? Maya asks. I think of Ruby, and I tell myself it's time. The door opens. Outside at last. Sky, grass, tree, ant, stick, bird, dirt, cloud, wind, flower, rock, rain, mine, mine, mine. Oops. I sniff, approach, strut a bit, but the others don't welcome me. They have sharp teeth and loud voices. Did I do something wrong? Kenyani chases me. She throws a stick at me. She corners me. I know that she's testing me to see if I'm a true silverback, one who can protect her family. I cower and hide my eyes. Maya lets me back into my cage. What it was like. I lie awake and try to remember what it was like being a gorilla. How did we move? How did we touch? How did we know who was boss? I try to think past the babies and the motorbikes and the popcorn and the short pants. I try to imagine Ivan as he might have been. Pretending. The juvenile male approaches. He's eyeing my food hungrily. I imagine a different Ivan, my father's son. I grumble and swat and swagger. I beat my chest till the whole world hears. Kenyani watches, and so do the others. I move toward the young upstart, and he retreats, almost as if he believes I'm the silverback I'm pretending to be. Nest. I'm making a nest on the ground. It isn't a true jungle nest. The leaves are inferior, and the sticks are brittle. They snap when I weave them into place. The others watch, grunting their disapproval. Too small, too flimsy, too an ugly thing to see. But when I climb into that leafy cradle... It's like floating on treetop mist. More TV. Maya wants me to go back to my glass cage. I can tell because she is tempting me toward the door with a trail of tiny marshmallows. I try to ignore her. I don't want to leave the outside. It's a cloudless day and I've found just the right spot for a nap. 
but I relent when she adds yogurt raisins to the trail. She knows my weaknesses all too well. In the glass cage, the TV is on. It's another nature show, jerky and unfocused. I expect to see gorillas, but none appear. I hear a shrill sound like a toy trumpet. My heart quickens. I rush close to the screen, and there she is. Ruby. She is rolling in a lovely pool of mud with two other young elephants. Another elephant approaches. She towers over Ruby. She strokes Ruby, nudges her. She makes soft noises. They stand side by side, just the way Stella and Ruby used to do. Their trunks entwine. I see something new in Ruby's eyes, and I know what it is. It's joy. I watch the whole thing, and then Maya plays it again for me, and again. At last, she turns off the TV and carries it out of the cage. I put my hand to the glass. Maya looks over. Thank you. I try to say it with my eyes. Thank you. It. Kenyani ambles toward me. She taps me on the shoulder and knuckle runs away. I watch her, arms crossed over my chest. I'm careful not to make a sound. I'm not sure what we're doing. She ambles back, shoves at me, dashes past, and then I realize what's happening. We're playing. We're playing tag. And I'm it. Romance. Make eye contact. Show your form. Strut. Grunt. Throw a stick. Grunt some more. Make some moves. Romance is hard work. It looks so easy on TV. I'm not sure I will ever get the hang of it. More about romance. I wish Bob were here. I could use some advice. I try to recall all the romance movies we watched together. I remember the talking, the hugging, the face licking. I'm not very good at this, but it's fun trying. Grooming. Is there anything sweeter than the touch of another as she pulls a dead bug from your fur? <laughs> Talk. Gorillas aren't chatty like humans, prone to gossip and bad jokes. But now and again, we swap a story under the sun. One day, it's my turn. I tell my troop about Mac and Ruby and Bob and Stella and Julia and George, about my mother and father and sister. When I am done, they look away, silent. Kenyani moves closer. Her shoulder brushes mine, and we let the sun soak into our fur. Together. The top of the hill. I've explored every nook and cranny of this place, except for a hill at the very far end where workers have been repairing a wall. They're finally gone. They've left behind fresh white brick and a mound of black dirt. While the others laze in the morning sun, I want to explore the hilltop. They've been there before, and I have not. Everything is still fresh to my eyes. I take my time going uphill, savoring the feel of grass on my knuckles. The breeze carries the shouts of children and the drowsy hum of bumblebees. Near the top of the hill is a low-limbed tree, the kind my sister would have loved. The wall is endless, clean and white, stretching far down to the habitats beyond my own. It's high and wide, carefully built to keep us in and others out. This is, after all, still a cage. It rained last night, and the pile of dirt is soft to the touch. I scoop up a handful and breathe in the loamy smell. It's a rich brown color, heavy and cool in my palm. And the wall waits like an endless blank billboard. Hmm. The wall. It's a big wall, but it's a big pile of dirt, and I'm a big artist. I slap handfuls of mud on the warm cement. I make a handprint. I tap my nose with a muddy finger. I make a nose print. I slide my palms up and down. The mud is thick and hard to use, but I keep moving and scooping and spreading. I don't know what I'm making, and I don't care. I make swoops and swirls and thick lines, figures and shapes, light and shadow. I'm an artist at work. When I'm done, I step back to admire my work, but it's a large canvas, and I'd like to get a better view. I go to the thick-limbed tree and grab the lowest branch. I try to swing my legs. Oomph! I land hard. I'm too big to climb, I suppose. I try again anyway, and this time I pull myself onto the first limb, gasping for breath. One more limb, two. I can't go any farther. 
perched halfway up the tree, I see my troop still dozing contentedly. I take in the wall, splattered and splashed with mud. Not much color, but lots of movement. I like it. It feels dreamy and wild, like something Julia might have made. From my seat in the tree, I can see beyond the wall. I see giraffes and hippos. I see deer with legs like delicate twigs. I see a bear snoozing in a hollow log. I see elephants. Safe. She's far away, belly deep in tall grass with others by her side. Ruby. She's here, Stella, I whisper. Ruby's safe, just like I promised. I call to Ruby, but the wind tugs at my words, and I know she'll never hear me. Still, Ruby pauses for a second, her ears spread wide like tiny sails. Then, with lumbering grace, she moves on through the grass. Silverback. It's a cloudy evening, chilly, chill and drizzly. Dinner is on its way, but I don't care. At night, we sleep in our den, but I'm always the last to head inside. I've been inside long enough. This time of day, there aren't many visitors, just a few stragglers leaning on the wall that separates us. They point, take a couple photos, then head over to the nearby giraffes. One of the keepers is beckoning. Reluctantly, I turn to go. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone running. I pause. It's a girl with dark hair lugging a backpack. The man follows behind, racing to catch up. Ivan, the girl yells. Ivan! It's Julia. I scramble to the edge of the wide moat that skirts the wall. Julia and George wave to me. I dash back and forth, hooting and grunting, doing a gorilla dance of happiness. Calm down, says a voice. You're behaving like a chimp. I freeze. A tiny, nut-brown, big-eared head pops out of Julia's backpack. Nice place, Bob says. Bob, I say, it's really you. In the flesh. How? Where? I can't seem to find any words. George's job at the zoo doesn't start till next month, so he and Julia made an agreement. She's walking three extra dogs to cover my food. And get this, they're all poodles. You said you didn't want a home, I say. Yeah, Bob says, but Julia's mom likes my company, so I figure I'm doing everybody a favor. It's a win-win. Julia pushes Bob's head back inside her backpack. You're not supposed to be here, she reminds him. Ivan looks great, doesn't he, Jules? George asks. Stronger. Happier, even. Julia holds up a little photo, but it's too far away for me to see. It's Ruby, Ivan. She's with other elephants now, because of you. I know, I want to tell her. I saw with my own eyes. We stare across the expanse that separates us. After a while, Julia, George pats Julia's arm. Time to go, Jules. Julia gives a wistful smile. Bye, Ivan. Say hello to your new family. She turns to George. Thank you, Dad. For what? For, she gestures towards me. For this. They turn to leave. The lamps that light the zoo pathways blink on, blanketing the world with yellow light. I can just make out Bob's little head sticking out of Julia's backpack. You are the one and only Ivan, he calls. I nod, then turn toward my family, my life, my home. Mighty Silverback, I whisper. The end. Oh. Oh. I would love to know what you guys think about this book. I love the ending. Um, I like how it showed that it really wasn't easy at first. It was not easy for Ivan to go back to something that was supposed to be normal for him. But it was definitely um, something he needed. It took a little time. He had to relearn some of those things. But in the end, I think he was a lot happier where he ended up than where he was before. 
Um, so there were a couple of questions. So why do you think that Ivan was reluctant to join the other gorillas when he arrived at the zoo? How did he learn to be a true gorilla? What does he need to do to be accepted by the others? How do you feel when you're in a situation with other children that you don't know? So this is something that you can relate to in your own life, that sometimes we're uncomfortable in a situation. What do we do um, to, to help ourselves feel comfortable um, in a new situation with people that we have never been around? Um, so it kind of makes us think about our own lives, but it makes us also think about animals' lives and and the difference between where he was before, where he had visitors, and where he was in the zoo. Um, and what do you think? Do you think he's in a better place now that he's with his own kind and he gets to actually be a silverback? I hope you enjoyed this book as much as I did. And I hope to see you guys on Zoom this week. If I don't, I hope you have a wonderful summer break. And I will see you again soon. Bye.